everybody, and welcome to Wake Up Missoula. I'm your host, Scott Ramph. I took a little uh, sabbatical last Friday. There's a lot of big things happening in the world, and I didn't know if I could articulate it quite as well as I could. But of course, as we're getting further and further into uh, peaceful protests across the U.S. nation against police brutality against uh, black people, one of the things that are uh, kind of happening is that you're seeing a lot of uh, great things happening on great acts of uh, good and great acts of evil. Videos coming up of police brutality, uh, videos coming up of police kneeling with uh, fellow black people, and uh, citizens who believe that black lives indeed matter. And it's not necessarily uh, an all lives matter kind of situation. The whole idea of black lives matter is a shortened, easy phrase to remember for a lot of groups of people who are protesting for equal um, representation and giving justice to those people uh, who have been segregated by systematic racism within uh, police department. All right, so one of the things that is also ha that happened as well is uh, this all kicked off when the U.S. has evolved into the protests about George Floyd George Floyd's controversial death at the hands of the Minneapolis Police Department when footage of Officer Derek Chauvin, uh, a white police officer, pressed his knee to Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. Protests and looting began the first couple of nights as many peaceful protesters began to grow and grow, uh, while looting started to subside over time as many peaceful protesters asked for looters to stop their uh, looting as well. Um, but of course, uh, many clashes with the police department in terms of rubber bullets, pepper spray, uh, use of force, hitting reporters, uh, shooting people uh, with uh, rubber bullets have been um, surfacing online as well. Um, a 75-year-old man was pushed by Buffalo police officers as well. Uh, many pe people on many different sides are doing many different things, and a lot of police officers um, from many different places are also mentioning this, like, that's not how we treat people in our community, while other places have been showing uh, bad things happening on either side. Um, many things, especially the one of the biggest turning uh, points that happened in these peaceful protests is that President Donald Trump um, used uh, National Guard and military to uh, disband protesters in Lafayette Square. Um, Mayor Bowser of the Washington, D.C. area um, later responded by uh, plastering Black Lives Matter in huge yellow letters across th four blocks and renaming Lafayette Square where protesters uh, would gather in front of the White House to Black Lives Matter Square. Um, while many people on both sides, one side protesting Black Lives Matter, while other civilians have taken arms saying that they will want to protect the city from looters, uh, Missoula has seen a growing number of folks in front of the Missoula County Courthouse, and many f folks wrote and um, emailed the city of Missoula showing concerns about uh, militia uh, civilians who were bringing uh, guns to protests um, for protection. Um, so, and I'll talk a little bit more about this in my city council report as uh, the city is responding to some of the concerns of people in Missoula who claim that they are uh, doing peaceful protests. Um, and there have been no reports of looting in Missoula as well. Okay, so moving on, uh, one of the biggest things that are happening, especially during this time, is uh, primary elections. So one of the things that kind of happened during all these peaceful protests, all these things just last week, is primary elections in Montana have been solidified. Greg Gianforte will uh, take on the gubernatorial election for a governorship of Montana. He'll be going against Lieutenant Governor Mike Cooney. Gianforte ran a race in 2016 against Steve Bullock, where he put down over a million dollars of his own money to run a campaign. He lost to Bullock in a really close uh, election, but now Bullock's uh, two-term limit in the state of Montana is up, and Bullock is uh, uh, pointing his eye uh, on the Senate race, where he'd be going against Steve Daines, um, incumbent who was once U.S. Representative of the state of Montana, moved up to Senator when, um, um, what's his name? Um, not Bullock, but, uh, uh, oh, man, it, now it's now it's blanking on my mind. You know, when 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 you have politicians leave uh, the state or leave their uh, job, it's kind of like they leave your mind forever. It kind of seems like, but yeah. Um, uh, like the uh, John Tester and another guy used to uh, be the two Democrat senators until uh, one of them retired and uh, um, uh, and then uh, Steve uh, Steve Daines took over for him when he uh, went uh, went against uh, oh man Max Baucus 
that's it. Oof, I'm not going to re-edit this. So you're going to watch this whole thing as I'm trying to think of the name of the guy who used to have the Senate seat before um, Steve Daines, Max Baucus. All right, moving on. Um, so, of course, one of the things that also are happening is that there is an open seat for the U.S. House of Representatives in the state of Montana. Montana only has one U.S. rep, and it's going to be going against... Um, Matt Rosendale, who went up against John Tester in 2018 and lost, um, and then Kathleen Williams, who also went up against uh, Gene Forte in 2018 um, in the uh, kind of the up in the air election once um, the U.S. Uh, representative uh, uh, Zinke, once he left uh, to uh, join the uh, Department of Labor under Trump's. Um, so there's just a lot of things happening in the state of Montana as well, but uh, Matt Rosendale is going against Kathleen Williams. Uh, Kathleen Williams lost to Gene Fourteen through 2018, and Matt Rosendale lost to you, Montana State Senator uh, John Tester in 2018 as well. Montana has been a very interesting in terms of uh, politics as well. We've been a fairly purple state. We uh, tend to elect a person more than what their party that they represent as well. Um, but of course, Montana has seen a lot of visits by President Donald Trump for support to uh, Matt Rosendale during the 2018 election. Um, and also saw that uh, uh, a lot of support for Gianforte along with many things that are what happened in the state of Montana as well. Of course, from what I noticed is that uh, Republicans in Montana have seen quite a lot of support from President Trump during those times. Of course, the last time uh, Montana had uh, seen a sitting president was Teddy Roosevelt. All right, so... Uh, that's enough trivia for you guys. Uh, here's a lot. Uh, there's a lot of stuff I need to talk about today during city council report. Uh, but here's some new programs airing on MCAT. And up next is pre. We asked specifically about after hours and what that looked like. Providers would say we had limited information. We had information that was hard to trust. It was disjointed. It didn't always make sense. If I was a provider at a critical access hospital, I may not see pediatric patients on a regular enough basis to feel confident or comfortable seeing that patient who's presenting maybe just with a G-tube or a trach or a Broviac because they're an oncology patient and it's 2 a.m. and now they have a fever. And that family's going right to their first access point. So we've really focused on what does it take to have a collaborative framework that is responsive to family needs, that informs families and informs providers so that moment that is the hardest moment for families can deliver the best quality care. Um, a certain amount of his work is idealized. And so we see the picture behind us here with this sort of ideal grouping. It's unrealistic in a sense, but what it does is capture a whole bunch of what Montana is about with the, you know, what I perceive to be the Mission Mountains. Uh, uh, Mission Mountains yeah. and a peaceable kingdom of animals right. and all the animals known to us in western Montana right. and a few exotics thrown in there. The yeah, bears, I was right? going to say the, <laughs> the polar bear. The polar bear, <laughs> yes, exactly. He's, he's yeah. wandered a bit, yeah, but, yeah. Uh, um, you know, it, it, it's... Uh, but again, it, there's a point of advocacy there, yes. right? And what is that point? He's showing us something. Well, most tickets, uh, like if you go to a football game here, actually, for the university, there should be a disclaimer printed on the back that you could be photographed uh, for promotional purposes and uses. So a lot of places will, will imprint that on tickets. So when you buy the ticket, you're, you're implying that you agree with the policy. We also, uh, when I do my work, I always post the sign, the legal sign. Uh, photography and videography are taking place in this area if you do not want to be a part of that. And it's going to be used for this purpose. If you don't want to do that, um, you need to not go into this area. Going into this area gives us permission. All right, well, that's a nebulous legal uh, area. Uh, it, it typically is never challenged. Um, the story of the microphone shortened has to do with a professor who was asked to speak for one hour, but he got carried away and uh, went on and spoke for one hour, two hours, three hours. <laughs> And at the beginning of the fourth hour, people started leaving. I mean, they had children to collect from school and other tasks and so on. But there was one man who remained at the front, you know, right there, and waited till the prof good professor um, stopped speaking to himself. And so at the end of uh, this uh, monologue with himself, he told this one man in the audience, thank you so, so much for staying till the end. I am very touched. 
and the man fidgeted a little and said, um, I was waiting to collect my microphone. So, <laughs> I see Neva has set me up with everything possible. This microphone will be taken away from me if I go on for too long. And I had prepared a longer talk, but I'm going to chop it off as we go along because I would also like to hear you, hear back from you. As we work on um, increasing protective factors, um, so making sure that uh, you guys, our, our, our parents, our grandparents, our uh, concerned community members are involved, um, that we, um, the kids have the ability to make positive peer relationships. Um, so like being part of a program like Flagship or Boys and Girls Club. Um, and then we also are trying to um, work on um, reducing drug availability. Um, we know that the more available a drug is, the more likely a, a child is going to use it. Um, and then also trying to reduce um, uh, trauma and other um, instances as well. So. guys welcome back let's talk about some movies that are coming out this weekend as well of course these aren't the movies that are coming out in theaters because theaters are not technically opening until sometime in july july seems to be a, a month for a lot of movies are testing the waters for these movies but these are the movies that are popping on streaming services shows and all sorts of things like that the first one is a rich kid he's kind of like richie rich uh, where uh, in that movie where you know his parents go missing, and then he has to take up the mantle of his family's fortune, blah blah blah. But anyways, this is kind of like um, Men in Black in a way because they're all wearing fancy suits and stuff. So anyways, a, a kid finds out that his dad was kind of like a monster hunter, um, kind of like kind of like Richie Rich, but now must take on the mantle because of reasons. Um, it's a kid's book, and you know, it's like where they always have like the kid, if the main protagonist always has to be thrust into a call to action kind of deal. So this is what you're going to get. Um, this is a kind of a Disney original movie based on a book, kind of like A Wrinkle in Time. So you're going to get the kind of Wrinkle in Time kind of dynamic with a really young kid actor who's kind of new or green or probably done a couple of Disney shows, but it was just like, we're well, making a movie with you. But a boom. Um, anyways, uh, this is going to be on Disney Plus, and the movie is basically, um, he gets a fairy, and he tries to steal the fairy's power to help save his family, but probably along the way he learns uh, tools and tricks along the way that he finds out that he doesn't necessarily need to use the fairy's power. He befriends the fairy, and he has equal uh, beliefs in the fairy, discrimination, that kind of thing. Um, and then he, uh, but I'm pretty sure they don't really save the family because it's a, a series of books, so it's just one of those mo kind of movies that are just like, this is going to go on for a while, but, well, actually not because this movie doesn't seem that great. So anyways, it'll be on Disney Plus this weekend, so you can check that out. And speaking of new this weekend, uh, it's uh, very interesting. You know those kind of generic kid shows with heavy consequences that maybe you shouldn't let your young young kids watch? But the colors and characters make you think, hey, this is cute, why not? This Hippo and the Age of the Wonder Beasts. Basically, imagine an anamorphic world of a post-apocalyptic wor world where uh, animals have evolved to be kind of humanist, but they still have their uh, cute um, animal instincts that everyone's like, oh, I remember, dogs chase their tails. So you have an animal-human-dog person who chases their tails, basically. And yeah, so this is uh, basically Hippo, who is a kind of a leopard kind of girl. She's a human girl who has leopard uh, animal hybrid powers. <sighs> and she has to save the human race from being enslaved by an animal dictator. There you go. There's, there's the thing. It's a show. Kids. <laughs> Up next, we got The Five Bloods. And it's a movie about a group of guys, maybe five of them, who knows, I can't tell, uh, trying to find treasure from their old unit commander in, from the Vietnam War. Um, past, present, and future collide in this um, series of, mo of movies where they come to terms of what they did and who they are, blah, 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 valor, betrayal, redemption. Um, probably some of them die. This seems to kind of be the case. Maybe one of them is like, I'm greedy. But, but we were soldiers. We're brothers. They're like, I don't care. I'm greedy. Blah, 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 blah. And then that's the movie, The Five Bloods. And, of course, you know, maybe a couple of them are just like, you know... Vietnam sucked, but I'm glad I have the five bloods to help me with this one.
So anyways, that's kind of what you expect from this movie. Chadwick Boseman's in this movie, so yeah, great. He's a great actor. I like him in movies. All right, so those are the pre-critic movies that are coming out this weekend. I have a new movie for you guys. It is a new dub and stuff that I made for you. Boys of the... Uh, it's, a, it's a series of uh, movies, of uh, short films. It's called Boys of the City, and it's from 1940. And here is dub and stuff. All right, boys. Here's your MTV. Oh, man, MTV Here's again. I hate you? MTV. What about the VH1? One what, what, that's not VH1 anymore? Mm -hmm. I think that's Paramount Here now. Here you go. Oh, man, the party just keeps getting bigger and bigger. I'll tell you what. Yeah, oh, man. One. Go on now. Eat it. Oh. Oh. Wow, this is some good pie-looking thing here. I love this kind of pie. I can't wait to have this pie in my mouth, and it's going to be delicious. Heck, yeah. Oh, whoo. Ooh wee! This pie is so delicious. Nom nom nom. I can't believe you have pie like this every day. Uh, no, not every day. It's just some days. Um, hey, hey guys, let me talk more about my mouthful. Nom nom. Eat eat eat. Munch munch munch. Nom 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 nom. Oh, hey guys, let me check out this jewelry box. Jewelry. That's in the middle I can of buy the myself the surgery one. So, Bugsy, what do you think about the food? Hey, yeah. They're pretty good. Ball howdy. Hey, man. This is the life. I like these kind of cigars. Perfect time to talk business. What do you guys think about talking business? It's good. It's not business that good, man. Concluded. Any uh, new business you guys want to talk about? Or just want to talk about old business as in business being good? I got something to say. Quiet. Well, why do you got to come down like that? He listens to alternative rock. Oh, well, that isn't so bad. Uh, hmm. You know what goes good with a cigar? A nice <laughs> crust dissolve. <laughs> oh, maybe the crust is... <laughs> maybe some people much. with asthma shouldn't smoke. Nah, yeah, this isn't organic. Hmm, cigars don't compliment pies at all, I tell you what. Uh, I just wanted to listen to Hoopa Stink. <laughs> oh, you guys quit oh, coughing, yeah. you're bumming me out. Alright, maybe this crust dissolve will help you guys feel better oh, about smoking those leg. cigars. But I don't my know, leg. I'm just a guy. Uh, man, I, uh, I can't believe you made us smoke those cigars. I pace myself, so I'm the last survivor. Uh, I don't want to be a tough guy anymore. <laughs> oh, come on, Whoa. scatter! Whoa. Whoa. Let's get out of here! Music. <laughs> what seems to be going on in here? <laughs> what do you go tell him, Smokey? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, good thing smoking is the worst thing they can do. Oh, but I'm distracted by the feet on the table. Perhaps smoking cigars is the reason why feet are on the table. Well, you're not wrong, after all. I do don't like smoking. Can instead of better myself. <laughs> yeah! Come on, let's get going. We got dates. Oh, with who? <laughs> yeah, you'll see. <laughs> Wow, we are back after two weeks of no city councils. So the city of Missoula haven't done any city council meetings. They did a committee of the whole meeting last Wednesday where they talked to the community members a little bit more about what's happening with the peaceful protests downtown Missoula. Um, Missoula has been hosting peaceful protests in the front lawn of the Missoula County Courthouse off Broadway Street. Uh, Beverly, uh, during public comment, is the first to speak about a presence of folks with guns in the downtown across from the protesters. And this is what she had to say. Yeah, I am just like concerned about militia presence downtown. I know that several folks have been like threatened and harassed. Um, and it seems like there's a lack of police presence or like police response to those things. Um, last updates I heard, the reports that have been filed to the PD hadn't been followed up with. And that's things that started like over a week ago. Um, and so I'm wondering whether anyone on city council is like willing to um, condemn that sort of behavior um, and like what the public health and safety plan is for addressing that, whether there's like a task force being created or something like that. 
the city council didn't necessarily speak directly to this person, but later on in the meeting, they address it during uh, public comments from the, um, actually, city comments. They share that at the very end of the meeting. A lot of times they don't do any kind of direct response, but um, Brian Von Losberg, city council member, talks about uh, initiative LR130, which um, he'll talk a bit, little bit about in response to uh, people who come to protests with guns. Uh, so despite the fact that I think many of us on council are, are sensitive to those concerns, um, we are limited. And most importantly, I would point people in, in the direction of the upcoming election and initiative LR 130. I think it's something people should be looking into and understanding how, uh, if that passes, our ability um, to limit firearms in places like city council and courts and city hall uh, and city parks uh, will be stripped away from the city as well. So it's a good opportunity for people to uh, educate themselves about initiative LR-130. Uh, you might be wondering what is exactly LR-130. So I looked it up and the words from the text say that the citizens of the state should be aware of, understand, and comply with the restrictions on the right to keep or bear arms that the people have reserved themselves to Article 2, Section 12 of the Montana Constitution that to minimize confusion the legislature withholds the local governments underline the power to restrict and regulate the possession of firearms. And so that's going to be part of the state constitution. It's going to be a bill that's going to be a, a thing that's happening as well. So if it, this passes, the Missoula can pass an ordinance within the city of Missoula to restrict the use of open carry guns or any kind of guns to be uh, located at you know places of polling places and that's something that they kind of brought up because um, schools they have uh, policies that you're not supposed to have guns in schools um, but which is where they usually have kind of election polling places but a lot of things have kind of altered and changed as many places are trying to avoid large groups of public gathering which could be schools which is a great way to spread disease as well I'm not saying that it's it's not but uh, school is a place where a lot of social gathering happens as well. Um, but that's one of the things that they're talking about. And I don't want to get too much in terms of the right to bear arms within a government building and stuff like that. But the uh, city of Missoula talks a little bit more about uh, LR-130, which is being proposed for an, up an upcoming election as well. So um, think about it, do some more research. And let's talk a little bit more about what's happening within the city of Missoula. Missoula, um, of course, housing is becoming a huge deal in the city of Missoula. And they had a presentation that talks about high cost of living in the city of Missoula. But, of course, it is only a sliver of how bad it is across the United States of America uh, in terms of just trying to f find affordable housing and also finding a matching job that actually helps you afford a place to live in the first place. So the offices of housing and community development talk about grants and funds. So this is not money that's going to be from the taxpayers. This is money that they're fishing uh, for from the federal government. Um, this is money that already is there that they uh, hand out through grants and application processes. And the city is trying to get money through this so they can afford to help people who are low income. Um, homeless folks of with f affordable housing and also one of the big things has become uh, available are vouchers. Vouchers are basically your uh, down payment and your first couple months rents are already even paid in full through these vouchers and they want to help improve these facilities but also hire people to um, be experts to help people in their circumstances. So here anyways here is uh, Karen Gasholds um, with the group that talks about their plans. The development and preservation of rental housing that has affordability requirements, the creation and preservation of homes that are affordable for Missoulians, the expansion of our capacity to address homelessness, and the assurance that these goals are being met. The progress we make toward these goals are reported to HUD annually through our consolidated annual performance evaluation report. Most of what she talks about are priorities of neighborhoods. You know, each neighborhood's different. Um, high density buildings, complexes, and stuff like that. How it matches the aesthetic of the neighborhood, while also at the same time doesn't um, block views, cast large shadows, and that kind of stuff. And um, all needs are different, but they use the model in a place to help growth and to be able to help those who meet the low incomes criteria. 
Uh, Colin Woodrow from the Office of Housing and Community Development talks about Missoula's difficulties when buying a home. In regards to home ownership, the median home price has increased from $200,500 in 2010 to $315,000 in 2019 for an increase of 57% over 10 years. The income needed to purchase that median price home has increased from $57,226 to 98,123, while the median family income for a four person household went from uh, $61,400 to $73,313 over that same decade. Uh, these numbers show that while incomes have risen, they have not kept pace with the increased cost of home ownership, making home ownership out of reach for many Missoulians. While many of you may be stressing about this and wondering how Missoula can let this happen, uh, the U.S. housing crisis has been a big issue uh, all around. Since 2009, many folks have lost their homes and had to deal with homelessness that are now affected more and more people. Missoula is a cheaper place to live than places such as California and with many people leaving larger cities to come live here. Um, the supply in housing has gone down and there, the demand for housing has gone up. But a lot of times community developments and organizations within the city of Missoula are trying to help people in Missoula stay in Missoula. Giving out, um, one, one of the things is Missoula has been working with developers to make affordable housing and even making sure that Missoula residents have a chance to purchase their homes. I mean, of course, I can go into more detail about this, but we'll talk about federal grants to help curve uh, the construction of more affordable housing. So here, once again, is Colin Woodrow talking a little bit more about this. The creation and preservation of affordable housing and housing assistance are routinely the most supported efforts which can be carried out using these federal funds. Assistance for rentals and down payment follow this. It should be noted that the city does help operate a home buyer down payment assistance program through the Human Resource Council, which is funded by the Montana Department of Commerce. Among the uh, organizations that he dropped was the Human Resource Council, and it's a huge help. They help me with my purchase of my house. They can give up to $30,000, um, 0% interest, and, and you never have to pay that back unless you decide to sell your house. Great deal, right? And they just want to make sure that you're, uh, they, they work with you. Um, another organization also uh, talks about Homeward. Um, and Colin talks about their plans in working with Homeward, which is a great organization within Missoula that teaches about renters' rights, while at the same time offering uh, classes for people who are first-time home buyers. Uh, these are our home recommendations. The first project uh, is the Trinity Project, which is being recommended for $806,000 of home investment partnership funds. The Trinity Project will create 202 new homes that Missoulians can afford to rent. This is through a partnership with Homeward, the Missoula Housing Authority, and Blue Line Development, as well as the state of Montana, the city of Missoula, Missoula County, lenders, private foundations, and of course, the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, LIHTC, funding source. And yes, high density is a part of that plan. Of course, many folks in the city of Missoula who live in a lot of these historic residential neighborhoods don't like the idea of high density housing so close to the neighborhoods. And that's something that's been controversial. I've seen it at city council meetings on and on and on again. Um, and there's a lot of uh, new buildings being built, be new neighborhoods being built, and um, a lot of high densities. And of course, vouchers in place for folks who suffer homelessness to give them a chance to get into stable housing long enough for them to start making stable income. Most of these grants that they're talking about uh, go towards creating and, and retaining residents that fall below the low income levels. Of course, another chunk is in response to COVID-19. So this is what Colin um, Woodrow talks a little bit more about COVID. The Co-Ed Homeless Task Force would like to recommend the following critical projects for funding at this time in response to the pandemic. Uh, Missoula City County Health Department, temporary public health social worker for $82,000. The Pavarello Center COVID-19 Outreach Response Team for $161,000. This team will work with the unsheltered population by providing in-field COVID symptom screens. The Pavarello Center Emergency Shelter Sanitation Project for $96,000. This grant provides additional resources and staffing to ensure that the Pavarello Center is in compliance with CDC cleaning guidelines. These services are being provided at the best of the current staff have to offer, but with these grants, money can be provided to create new jobs and create uh, services to uh, make it more concrete 
in moving forward with helping people in the city of Missoula. But of course, all this is federally funded grants and will not make you uh, pay out of pocket for these services. This is organizations that already exist in place, and they're always um, they're always wanting to get more and more money um, through grants and these processes as well. So, of course. Um, one of the big things that's happening within the city of Missoula is that a lot of city council members during their time talked about Black Lives Matters. So I made a montage of a lot of city council members talking about how they feel about Black Lives Matter and about the police department and how uh, um, their reaction to uh, how Missoula is kind of um, reacting to the death of George Floyd, George Floyd and, of course, Black Lives Matter. So this is what they had to say. We are heartbroken that it even needs to be said, Black Lives Matter. We work against racist agendas and ideologies every day by demonstrating that our religious voices and values of building shelter through strength, stability, and self-reliance are purposely intended for all in our community. We are proud of the diversity in our growing number of partner families, our volunteer base, and our community. And no matter our faith, we all aspire to uphold the golden rule, treat others how you wish to be treated. We can all agree that the police, police brutality and police corruption is absolutely horrendous. And we can all agree, everyone on council, I can assume that um, everyone on council, the mayor, everyone in the Missoula Police Department, all agree that police brutality and police corruption is absolutely horrendous and should not be accepted on any, any number of ways. However, we must not persecute the many because of the actions of the few. I promised that I would not take away funding from the police, fire, roads, and schools when I was elected into office. I take that promise very seriously. In this time when the nation is trying to divide, I will not accept that. I will uphold my oath of office and I will fight to keep funding for the police. Um, so I, I wanna thank everyone who's out there, rain or shine, and, um, and for keeping at it uh, and for keeping um, civil. I, I think what's happened over the last 10, 12 days has been horrifying and shocking in our country, but it also is creating a really strong dialogue. And having seen this cycle numerous times, I am crossing my fingers and I am hopeful that this dialogue goes farther and there is change that comes from it. Remain grateful to those who are dedicating so much effort to making our society more equitable and more just right now. And I remain committed to listening to those voices and acting with reason and compassion um, in the coming months. Thanks, everyone. Of course, you know, there's a lot of things happening within the city of Missoula, and this is one piece of a very large uh, puzzle with, that's going across the United States in terms of protests and um, people trying to get the word out and tell people that. Uh, there's something going on that needs to change. Of course, if you do wish to get involved with the local government and you have something to say, you can always look at all the resources provided by the City of Missoula by logging on to ci.missoula.mt.us. And for, uh, of course, my City Council report, I usually like to end it with uh, uh, another video from the City County Health Department talking a little bit about what's happening within Missoula for uh, COVID-19. So without further ado, here's City County Health Department update. Good day, Missoula County. Today is Thursday, June 11th. I'm Ken Parks, Acting Incident Commander for the Missoula County COVID-19 Response Team. This afternoon, I'm going to update you with current local and state case counts and review the county COVID-19 testing process from making an appointment to receiving test results. I'll also talk a little bit about the nuances of scientific testing to inform understanding of scientific testing accuracy in general and what that means for COVID-19 testing specifically. As of this morning, we've had a total of 41 cumulative positive cases to date in Missoula. 39 of those cases were identified by testing and two of those cases were epilent. We have had 40 recoveries and one death. We have no active cases in isolation currently. The state has had a total of 563 cases, including three new cases confirmed this morning. New cases today are reported in Gallatin and Yellowstone counties, and the state is reporting 58 active cases across the whole state. 
Today, the county continues offering testing services for Missoula County residents currently experiencing known COVID symptoms and healthcare workers and first responders working in Missoula County that are currently experiencing known COVID symptoms. As mentioned in prior daily briefings, the county is in the process of expanding its testing criteria and determining what that will look like in Missoula County. We continue working with community partners to develop a plan that not only meets current local level needs, but also anticipates future local level needs. Recall that Missoula County is one of 20 high visitation communities in Montana as defined by the state. While these high visitation communities share that designation and will receive additional resources for community testing and contact tracing, broader testing will look different in different counties. We are already seeing this. This is because each county is tasked with determining the best way to use, implement, and evaluate the use of those additional resources at the local level. A different approach does not mean that one county is doing something better or worse than another. In fact, it is likely a very good thing that different counties are taking different approaches to best meet their local needs. If each county has an informed, tailored approach that it increases the chances of best serving the greatest number of people with the resources available. Remember that resources is also a very comprehensive and is a broader than funding alone. It also includes things like supplies and staff. Missoula County is unique in that in addition to being a high visitation community, it is also more densely populated than other counties. It also serves as a healthcare hub for many people living outside of city and county limits and even outside of the state of Montana. Missoula County's healthcare hub is just one of several components that county leadership takes into consideration when develop, developing and implementing a broader testing criteria. Our local level plan for broadening testing is in process and progress remains steady due to our great collaborative partnerships across the county, as well as information gleaned from thoughtful communication with other counties with similar considerations like population size, healthcare infrastructure, and tourism considerations. We continue sharing information as it becomes available, and once we finalize the plan, we send it to the state for review and approval. After approval, we will be able to share more specific details with you and guide the community through the process of implementing the broader testing criteria. Before we expand our testing criteria in the coming weeks, I'd like to revisit our current ongoing testing processes so that you are familiar with these processes as well as the science behind the process and the test. If you are someone that meets our current testing criteria, you can call 258-INFO Monday through Friday from 8 a.m. to 5 p.m and speak with a nurse who will guide you through the next steps. Once you're on the phone with the nurse, they will ask you a handful of what we call screening questions to determine your symptoms, risk, and exposure. If it is determined that you meet current testing criteria, then you will receive either a same day or a next day appointment, depending on our capacity. You will also receive very specific instructions about the appointment, the process, and expected next steps. The county fairground site can safely accommodate drive-through testing by appointment only. This ensures that both community and personnel are as safe as they possibly can be from arriving at the appointment to leaving the testing site. Let's say you have an appointment and you are asked to arrive at 10 a.m. In, in a vehicle. Well, you stay in the vehicle for the entire process. Staff will greet you and verify your identity, much like you experience at the doctor's office. This ensures that you are the patient scheduled for that time. After verifying your identity, staff guide you to an educational station where you'll learn about isolation steps and why it's so important to remain in isolation until you receive negative results or you finish your 14-day quarantine. The next station is the testing station. Patients are given very specific instructions on how to complete a self-swab using a mid-turbinate swab on both nostrils with guidance and observation by a nurse. If a patient needs assistance, perhaps due to limited physical or cognitive abilities or young age like a kiddo, a nurse, of course, will swab for you or assist you with the swabbing. Staff ensure that the specimen is carefully and safely put into a patient-labeled tube with a viral transport solution that protects the, spe the specimen until it is ready to be processed at the state lab. The specimen is placed in a transport bag with appropriate paperwork and refrigerated as quickly as possible. Samples are sent via courier to the state lab for processing. The state system updates as specimens are processed and the Missoula County Health Department nurses follow up with patients regarding their results and next steps. Notification is private and confidential. Nurses only speak with the patient or whoever the patient has legally, legally authorized to hear their personal medical information. 
The test kits used at the county are mid-turbinate swabs that are as sensitive as a standard nasopharyngeal swab. These test kits specifically look for RNA related to COVID-19. They do not look for anything related to any of the other coronaviruses or the flu. This means if you have COVID, it will likely find it. But if you have the flu, you will need to have a different test. Accurate test results are necessary to both develop meaningful care plans and flatten the curve or keep it flat as we are currently doing in Missoula County. That being said, any scientific test for any virus has its limitations. This is just the nature of the beast. The sensitivity of county COVID tests or the likelihood that the test will pick up the COVID if it is there is about 96%. This is incredible and very accurate, but it still leaves a margin of testing error at about 4%. This margin of error has nothing to do with any individual, but rather is directly related to the test itself. This means that if a test is perfectly collected, transported, and assessed, there is a 96% chance of correctly identifying COVID if it is present. And there's a 4% chance of the test not identifying COVID if it is present. The same is true when we look at a test sensitivity or the likelihood that the test correctly identifies that COVID is not there. Again, no known test exists for any known virus that is 100% accurate. This relates to the nature of scientific testing in general. I'm sharing all this information today to let you know what county testing currently looks like in our community. The information I shared captures the testing process for the county only, from making an appointment to swabbing to notifying results. Testing processes and criteria are different at different clinics. While we are in constant communication with our medical partners, each organization operates slightly differently to best address their needs while working within the structures of their own organizations. For example, while the county exclusively sends specimens to the state lab, other providers might have other lab contacts or contractual agreements in place. Well, we look forward to continuing to serve Missoula County in the best way possible with the information and the resources that we have available. Please continue with those safety practices and please continue taking care of each other. Kindness and compassion and understanding can go a long way. Thank you. Well, that about does it for Wake Up Missoula. I wanted to thank uh, everyone for joining me today. Um, there's a lot going on, and there's just too much to talk about for sure. Um, it's very interesting how we uh, kind of adjusted from just talking about COVID-19 as the only thing that's happening in the news and how people are coping with it. Now we're talking about uh, Black Lives Matter again. Um, this is something that uh, many people, it's been going on for many years, and this is something that has kind of united a group of people, groups of people, a lot of people, um, in moving forward, and hopefully the momentum gets very positive change within the United States, and that's all I have to say about that. Um, but thanks you guys for joining me. A lot of show, a lot of things happening as well. But for Wake Up Missoula, I'm Scott Ramp. I hope you guys have a good weekend. Take care, hang out, go outside. It's been a lot of great weather out there. Um, we've had some really weird cold snaps earlier this week, but we're past that and it looks like we're going to have some beautiful weather going into the weekend.